All right then. Hello everyone. I trust that you are well and I trust that you are safe wherever you are. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 19th webinar in the Economics of COVID-19 series. It, today's series is co-hosted by SOAS Economics Department and SOAS Open Economics Forum. SOAS Open Economics Forum is part of the global rethinking economics that aims to promote pluralism and heterodoxy in economics. You can follow up you can follow SOAS Economics and SOAS Open Economics Forum on the social media platform as pinned in the chat box on the right side of your screen to catch up with previous webinars and to stay up to date with upcoming webinars. By introduction, my name is Taibat Uzain. I am a Master of Development Economics student here at SOAS. I am also a member of the SOAS Feminist Network a network of SOAS students and alumni that discuss research and share ideas about feminism and gender issues within the realm of economics. I also empower young African women to use their voice through an online platform called Women Speaker Tribe. Today's webinar is on the theme Economics of COVID-19 in Africa and African Feminist Perspective. It is a topic that I'm very excited about and I hope you're also excited and unlike previous webinars, this session will take a form of conversation among three remarkable women in the feminist economic space. We have Sonia Falasi, we have Lynn Osome, and Krista Simeone. Before I hand over to Sonia, who is the moderator for today's session, I will briefly read out their bio so we know the speakers. I'll start with Sonia. Sonia is a researcher and economist at the Institute for Economic Justice. The IEJ is an economic think tank based in Johannesburg and works at the intersection of policy, research, and activism. The IEJ's core objective is to provide policymakers with is to provide policymakers and progressive social forces in social in South Africa with access to rigorous economic analysis and well thought through policy options as a basis for concrete intervention. Sonia's research interests include the role of private finance in development, climate justice, and feminist economics. Lynn Osome is a senior research fellow at the Makarere Institute of Social Research, where she teaches politics and political economy. Her specializations are in the field of feminist political economy, feminist political theory with research interest in land and agrarian studies, gendered labor, and the political economy of gendered violence. She is the author of Gender, Ethnicity, and Violence in Kenya's Transitions to Democracy, State of Violence. She is also the co-editor of the forthcoming volume, Labor Questions in the Global South. She has been a visiting scholar at National Chiantong University and Wheat University. She's also a visiting fellow at Yale University. She serves on several institutional boards, among them is the International Association for Feminist Economics. Krista Simeone is the director of the Nawi AfriFem Macroeconomics Collective. Her work revolves around macro-level economic inequalities through a pan-African feminist lens. This entails policy and advocacy at regional and global policy space. A lot of our work is around ensuring government and women's rights organizations understand and demystify economics, social and political policies from a pan-African perspective. She champions for women at all levels to be able to influence macroeconomic policy decision making and therefore giving balance of power within these platforms and processes. Um, please feel free to drop any questions that you may have during the conversations in the chat box and the speakers will address them accordingly. And if you would like to tweet this conversation, please use the hashtag economics of COVID. At this juncture, I'll hand over to Sonia. Um, thanks, Tybert, for the introduction. Good afternoon to everyone and thank you for joining us. I hope you can hear me okay, Crystal and Lynn. 
Awesome. Um, I am delighted to be moderating this conversation with two remarkable feminists who have both been guiding lights for me in thinking through what it means to be a feminist economist. And in today's conversation, I will pick their brains on their thoughts and experiences of the pandemic so far. And hopefully we can also get into what a feminist response to the, the pandemic would look like and whether this moment presents an opportunity for our feminist alternatives to take center stage, particularly in economic policy making. Um, as Tybert mentioned, please feel free to ask questions in the comment section. And after about 30 minutes into the conversation, I will field these questions to both Crystal and Lynn. Um, please also feel free to include your name and where you are in the world currently. And so to begin, I would like to take a step back just a little bit to think through how we got here. And Lynn, um, a lot of your work on feminist political economy has been very intentional in reckoning with the past and reckoning with our histories that are by no means accidental to what we're currently facing now. And so to start, off, to start us off, I wonder if you could highlight what key aspects of the pandemic have been foregrounded for you and what role you think history, particularly African feminist histories, should play in our thinking around um, policy responses to, to the crisis. I was mute. I, I muted myself. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, I mean, thanks, Sonia, for the for the question. Um, in in terms of um, the crisis, uh, it, it has um, highlighted me a number of of um, of issues, and I'd like to highlight four. Uh, one is have. Is it possible to get rid of all this sound coming in? I don't know. Um, one is I've been struck by the ways in which um, the capitalist state, not capital, I'm talking of the state itself. So I've been really struck by the ways in which the capitalist state reaches for women and gendered labor in terms of crisis, in, in, during times of crisis like these. And so food, access to food and survival itself has become synonymous with women's labor or gendered labor. That is one. And two, it has also, for me, raised the specter of the sort of infrastructures that make poverty livable. And I, I mean this in an ironic sense and make suffering bearable. Because this is something we know, you know, everyone who, who has been waging a critique of, of capitalism has, has, you know, thinks about it in, in terms of, in, time, in, in, in relation to dignity and suffering and so on. So, you know, I've thought a lot about what are these structures that make this kind of, you know, poverty and suffering bearable and uh, livable. And one of it, of course, is housing, because the immediate response that we saw in many places was, uh, you know, it's as if the cramped conditions of housing in informal settlements and in slums just became apparent. These have been with us. But during this time when we needed to practice uh, physical distancing, then it became, a, you know, a question that we were discussing alongside the crisis that COVID had produced. And, you know, another, uh, you know, such infrastructure or condition is just the ability to go to work, the idea of working itself. So, and, and uh, in a lot of people see it as, you know, to go to work is to leave the house or to go somewhere and get, you know, so even the self-employed, I, I know a lot of the trade that women do in informal settlements, you know, where you work, where you live is where you work, you know, you sell your tomatoes or onions out there. But still, that even that was truncated for a lot of people. So this uh, idea of, of working itself, 
even when you're not earning sufficient income. And thirdly, it has, for me, also highlighted um, the fundamentally agrarian uh, character of this crisis. And I'll talk about this later. And, and, and fourth, uh, of course, this is something that is widely remarked uh, that um, these features are not, have not been produced by COVID itself. Uh, what COVID has done is that it has highlighted the gendered uh, and exploitative structure of the capitalist society in which we live, right? And all of these have historical, these are historical continuities. They have roots, you know, we, we've been here before in a sense, African feminists would say that when, you know, in our studies of the colonial political economy, uh, you know, so I for one believe that there's not much we can uh, understand about these contemporary manifestations outside of the set of institutional and structural legacies that configured uh, gendered labor and women's labor as an, you know, a, a sort of, it was the, a necess the necessary condition of the stabilized, you know, political stabilization of, of the colonial uh, political economy of the forced uh, migrant labor regime, right? And so the post-colonial neoliberal state has failed to break with this uh, model, this model of dependence on a non-capitalist, uh, uh, at that time, rural realm uh, of subsistence, which supplements you know, poorly paid wage labor. But this is no longer, in the current times, it's no longer just a rural kind of relation of, of supplementing uh, wage labor. We are also seeing an urban manifestation. So there's now an urban demand for say land, so all these struggles we see around housing, uh, you know, shack dwellers movements, and so on. There are demands around land. They are, they are articulated to questions of food and subsistence. People are saying we need to be able to eat. We need to be able to feed ourselves. Um, I know in South Africa, maybe many third, fourth, fifth generation of urban dwellers don't really have concrete links with, with a rural domain. But this is also an urban, seriously urban manifestation. So that is one with the historical, you know, the role of history in thinking these things. And another thing for me has been um, that gendered labor has really, you know, feminist critiques have understood it in this wage, uh, wage labor capital relation. So in, within the idea of exploitation, as you know, saying gendered labor or women's labor contributes to surplus value, the production of surplus value. But the reality that we are dealing with today is, you know, at least in the last two decades, has been a massive attrition of, of uh, industrial, of, 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 of labor from industry and from manufacturing. And, and in fact, there are large, sections of the of the working population of labor force that capital doesn't actually need anymore it's just uh, you know surplus and and so the question that we have to ask ourselves is what is happening what has been happening to those uh, those masses of people that are being expanded from industry uh, who is looking after them when they are no longer being uh, needed and this is a question that remains current in fact under covid you could multiply this by you know you know really exponentially because apart from those who are already kind of floating uh, and latent labor now we have people who have been you know a, a millions of jobs have been lost and we'll have to think about uh, that not just who is looking after them. But even post-COVID period, there's a lot of those people who will simply not be going back into employment. They, they, it just will not 
happen, you know. Uh, so we, we need to think about what kinds of social reproductive structures are going to be needed to look after that uh, population. And uh, uh, that uh, is to reflect on the, the social question. This is a, a useful way I found of thinking through uh, the crisis that COVID is producing, is to reflect on the social question that is being raised by COVID in terms of, you know, as a, as a political, it's political manifestations. And I'm looking this again in relation to history. So um, it's political because historically, when you looked at the forms of resistance that were waged by African women, uh, you know, what we think of as anti-colonial struggles, um, women were, underlying those struggles were usually a critique of social problems, of the ways in which women were experiencing the colonial state and the colonial political economy in very specific ways. So women were, you know, they were involved in peasant struggles, uh, you know, struggles over land. And this was because women could see very clearly that a lot of the land with with the you know with primitive accumulation a lot of the land that was used to reproduce communities and families was being taken away you know fertile land redirected towards cash crop farming women were protesting against labor because they could see very clearly that their labor and their time was being redirected from the production of uh, you know sort of food crops into uh, not only cash crops, but into other structures, you know, soil erosion and, and that kind of thing. And of course, there were protests over taxes, the protests over, uh, you know, women wanting over the, uh, you know, efforts to control women's sexuality. So this again, so all of these were articulated to a question of you know, the, the social reproduction, women's relations to their communities. And today, again, we are seeing in this COVID period an increase in, uh, in uh, reports on violence, right, um, in domestic violence, which is already imploding into the public. And and, and of course, we have to see this and the, the kinds of resistance that accompany it as um, a sort of political response that is, that is needed, right? Economic problems uh, tend to, uh, uh, or economic crisis tend to manifest a social crisis that deal political solutions. So this, I, I, I leave it there for now in terms of thinking of key aspects of the crisis and the sort of historical um, rearticulations that we're seeing in relation to, to COVID. And, um, and, and the forms of social that are Sorry, we can't. Sonia, you're breaking. We can't hear you. Internet. Saying that in the UK, work.
I'm not still there because she has sent me a question so I can answer it. Um, okay. Can you oh, wow. I can see her, but she's squeaking. So. I'll give her two seconds. Okay. Hi, but okay, I'll go ahead. Um, so I'll pretend I'm Sonia and read her question. She had sent me sort of a directive around what she wanted to ask, and her question to me was: um, Many are saying that the economic fallout of the pandemic will be seismic and that many countries, particularly African countries, will particularly be affected. Tied to this, that our debt levels will reach unsustainable levels. For example, many in South Africa are lamenting the possibility of South Africa's debt becoming larger than 70% of our GDP. There's this ahistorical narrative that African economies are constrained by high levels of debt, and this will inevitably set us back. Uh, you have spoken, I have spoken, <laughs> a lot about public-private partnerships and illicit financial flows and how these issues are also feminist issues. How is the conversation about debt also feminist issue and linked to this? What role does the state and private sector have in advancing a feminist alternative? So I will hand over to myself. <laughs> um, and so I'll start off with a quote from a song that says, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, Lynn has spoken about forms of land resistance and resistance that women have have been putting forth against colonialism, around against capitalism, against um, neo neoliberal forms of capitalist intervention, and things that are constantly so violently in our spaces, both as we're trying to make a living and trying to exist on the continent. Uh, the work that I do straddles two fights, which makes it very complicated sometimes. It straddles a fight against neoliberal, neocolonial neoliberal models, but it also straddles a fight against neocolonialism. And so it's one against the patriarchy and at the same time, once again, one against capitalism. And so I'll start off by saying that by May, East African countries had borrowed nearly $2.2 billion in loans in less than three months since reporting the first COVID positive cases. And this is just in addition to all the loans and the debt that we've been seeing against the backdrop of a tax revenue that is drastically dropping. Not only is our tax revenue dropping, but our export earnings and our diaspora remittances are also in, tr in trouble. And so this is really working together to paint a really dire picture for the continent. Um, just this, this last week, we learned that the African Union COVID-19 special envoys have raised about 30 billion US dollars for the continent's response to the pandemic. But again, the devil is in the details. We have no idea of whether this money and these resources are in loans and grants, and if any of the above, what terms we're taking the money and the resources from. And this, again, poses a huge problem. We're celebrating as a continent, but at the same time, are we really celebrating? There's been calls around debt and beyond debt moratoriums, the call for debt cancellation should be a priority. And we remember Thomas Sankara saying at the African Union in his address in the 80s, well, if we decide to pay back our debt, we definitely will be killing the people of Africa. Our governments, the states of Africa, we will not be able to provide for our citizens in terms of healthcare, in terms of food, in terms of education. But if we don't, surely nobody dies. And I'm paraphrasing his words. His speech was very powerful and can be found in YouTube. And so I wonder if we should be going back to those, those words of his. And I wonder what a cancellation of debt would look like. But we need to also start asking deeper questions about what debt we're taking. 
and how are we not putting or putting citizens at the center of decision making and policies that affect ourselves. So I'll take Kenya as an example. And I've been writing a paper on the man, what they're calling managed equipment scheme project that's been running for the last five years. It's got two years left in its lifetime. And the, the program was to borrow money to take to lease specialized equipment for hospitals across the country, um, specialized equipment for ICU facilities, for dialysis, for theater. Um, and the the budget for the health sector in the last two years, this was the fourth highest spend in terms of what the health budget had as a priority. The fourth highest spend to lease out specialized equipment, three quarters of which is still lying unused in, in hospitals across the country because hospitals didn't have three phase electricity to run the equipment, didn't have running water to run the equipment, didn't have doctors and sometimes specialized doctors or doctors at all to run this very specialized high tech equipment. And so it brings into question what priorities our states are putting at the center and who's driving these priorities. Um, how many IMF World Bank decisions are really pushing um, what our countries, our states are taking into consideration as they prioritize funding and debt that we're taking. And so we sit at a crux in time where it's important to begin to reimagine the role and the character of the African state to reimagine it through the social contract and open up what this contract means for us. The rise of what many call the Wall Street consensus taking over from the Washington consensus through the World Bank's cascade approach that is pushing our African economies to deregulate and change legislation and policy for the ease of private finance to come in because we are told this private finance will be the silver bullet to solve our development gaps with efficiency. We have seen over and over how it does the complete opposite. We sign deals for white elephant mega infrastructure projects that our people don't use, but who will be paying for generations to come. We have trains in Kenya that are big and, and have spent so much money and taken so much in terms of loans, but yet our taxpayers is what will, is who will be paying for generations to come. A train where majority of our food is grown by smallholder farmers who will never get on that train and never use the train to transport their food and their commodities, yet we'll be paying through VAT, through commodity tax and other forms of taxation. And so I question how we can disassociate ourselves from this policy making. I question how many of our central bank governors, how many of our ministers of finance are ex-IMF, ex-World Bank, and what that means for the development of our state. For the development of our states that also lack a political project to drive our policy and development agendas that is so inextricably linked to our debt, to conditionalities that come with our debt, and what that means for the future of our continent. I will stop here. I wonder if Bonga is back on. Hi, Sonia. I think she's back. Okay. But I don't think she's connected. Right. Sonia, if you could drop your questions in the chat box and I'll read it out to the speakers. I hope she can hear me. I can add one little bit as she comes back. Okay, then please go on. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to add as well as our African states are really pushed towards a private financing mechanism for development, um, it's important to remember that this is happening against the backdrop of a narrative that tells us that the African state is incapable of providing for her citizens, is incapable of providing for me to ensure that I am able to take any children that I have to a decent and quality school facility or have children in a safe hospital. Um, and be able to access that universally um, against the backdrop of the fact that Africa loses about not less than $100 billion to illicit financial flows by these very same multinationals that we're then turning to as, you know, as a silver bullet to, for our developmental gaps. And I think that contradiction is something that we need to really put at the center of our thinking and really inform um, who we get help from, what we decide is help, and how we inter interact with debt. Mm -hmm. 
she back? Oh, okay, so before she um, we sort this out, I'll just take it up from the depth that you mentioned. Um, we know that the, there's more adverse consequence on debt, especially in Africa. Could you um, suggest or recommend alternative to this debt if we're not um, if we're not going to rely on it because it it's always difficult because of the vices um, associated with the debt. Could you recommend or suggest other alternatives that we can, that policymakers, the government can look um, into? Um, I think that's a multi layered question that uh, is not easy to answer, but I'll try. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more to implement our Agenda 2063 and really own our own processes, narratives, and frameworks. I think we have, we've got great minds on the continent that can give us direction um, and give us direction in terms of development. Um, we, the Global South produces over 60% of raw materials, over 60% of labor, but we only accrue less than 5% of global wealth. And this, I think, is something that needs to be at the back of our heads. Um, some have called it a global apartheid of decision making in the global economic uh, landscape. And I think we have to remember that as much as there has to be local solutions for local problems, we exist in a very hyper globalized uh, world where there is indeed global solutions to very, very local problems. So case in point is our tax, our tax base. Um, and are we able to follow the guidance of the African Tax Administrators Forum, for example, who have given models, recommendations, and frameworks of tax models that are retrofit for our African economy so that we are maximizing our tax revenue from multinationals that have found all sorts of ways to find loopholes to ensure that they're not paying their, their fair share of tax in the space and in the countries that they're operating in. I go back to the fact that we're losing not less than $100 billion in illicit financial flows, and we get less than half of that in developmental assistance. Simple mathematics is that we can pay for our own development. I think the concept of economics needs to be demystified. Too many a time, economists sort of paint this picture as if economics is already technical and really too hard for most of us to understand. I think we need to politicize it to come back to a space where it is really about power. It's about who gets to decide what the quality of my life is, how dignified my life is. And I think that needs to be put at the at front and center of those. I don't understand why the IMF and the World Bank should be making decisions about a, an African woman's life in rural Africa, and she's living it and understands and knows what needs to change um, for, her, for, her, for her life. I think there needs to be a more participatory approach um, with citizens for women, for example, to be able to sit at decision making tables and contribute to making decisions that really affect their lives. But at the same time, I call for solidarity across the world. The OECD, which is really a group of rich countries, sit and make tax regulation and framework for all of us that we should all implement on equal footing. I think this is highly unsustainable and the COVID crisis has really brought forth, you know, the fact that this neoliberal, very capitalist space that false consciousness of what we've been living is completely not sustainable and something has to change. I think decision-making in terms of global economic structures needs to change, be more inclusive, and really have us sitting at the table on fair, on fair grounds and, and, and be more inclusive as a space as well. Um, I think with all these, as, I, as many have said, all oppression is linked. And with an, a more just framework, I think issues such as debt, issues such as trade justice, tax justice, will begin to, to readjust to a more fair system. But that includes a lot of people letting go of a lot of privilege, um, and that's not easy. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if Sonia is back. Uh, if she's not back, I will quickly pose this question to Dean. Um, Lynn, you're quite aware of the adverse effect of COVID-19 on women in Africa. We can see um, increase in 
domestic violence, we can see in Nigeria they're recording increase in teenage pregnancy, um, sexual violence, rape cases. Do you think or can you give a case study of Kenya or Uganda? Is there a gender response strategy put in place by the government or is there something that the government should be doing but they're not doing? Well, um, I can't speak of specific interventions. Um, you know, what, what I could try to do is generalize um, what we are seeing, a trend that we are seeing. And that, as you say, is um, an increase in the levels of, 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 of violence, not just domestic violence, but, you know, femicide, what we are seeing in South Africa. And I've, I've been reflecting on this in, in, a, in a broader way, you know, what, especially how it, um, it articulates this question that I was talking about earlier, you know, the economy, the questions of social reproduction. And one way we could think about these kinds of violence that we are seeing is, you know, what happens when the, you know, the conjuncture between social welfare and the economy, uh, you know, the, the collapse of uh, social welfare and the collapse, the, and, and economic collapse, what results out of it, right? And, you know, what, in a sense, what resources remain or become available or unavailable to people with this kind of, uh, these two pillars um, of the market itself collapses. And one of the things we are seeing now in a very real sense is a contestation between the state, the, 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 the capitalist state, but the state itself, there's a, a contestation between the state and the family household, you know, the domain of, when we think of social reproduction, we are thinking of three domains of the market, the family household, and the state. And so what this economic crisis has done is to diminish the role of the market. So we are seeing a real contestation between the state and the household uh, as, as the primary domains of social provisioning. And, and the state's response um, in that sense has been almost, you know, it, there's a direct intervention. And, and this, this kind of direct intervention is actually part of the, the solutions the proposals that are being put forward by economists, right? Whether it is uh, cash transfers and all these kinds of things. But at, apart from that, the state by its nature and its character is going to take advantage. So we are seeing um, uh, the uh, an increased intervention of the state into this you know, so-called private, I'm saying private in quotes, because feminists have waged a, a long and sustained critique about the notion, the division between the public and the private. We know it is not so. Um, so one of the things that feminists and on the continent are thinking about is that what kinds of uh, policy interventions would be acceptable without rolling back the gains that you know, feminists have made and women have made over a very long period of time, uh, critiquing violence, resisting violence, whether it is through laws, whether it is through policies. And if we are not watching this, if we are not watching this clash between the state and the household and the family, we are going to go back to, to square one, in, in a sense, in the post-COVID period, if we can imagine such a period. Um, but also is, you know, um, the, the thing I mentioned uh, earlier uh, in, term, in, in the key aspects of the crisis that have stood out for me, and one, of, one was the way in which the state has been reaching for, for uh, you know, women's labor and gendered labor. So in Uganda, for example, the one sector that was not shut down even when we were under total lockdown, was the informal sector, and not just informal generally, the food, you know, so women who are selling food, uh, there was a direct a directive 
that you know markets would remain open but only sale of food and i i did go to the market on a weekly basis because there are things i need from there and predominantly it was women you know selling food you know you, it, it, it really was the condition for that opening up of the market was that they would sleep there so in fact certain organizations like siha have shown how uh, many women were being rendered homeless at the same time you know so here is the state pulling you and saying look uh, we need that labor we need you to keep the link between the the rural food the food that is coming from the rural areas and urban consumption but we need you to do it in a certain way we need you your bodies your physical presence in those markets we are not going to let you move but you're going to provide you with mosquito nets and and so on nobody was talking about testing these women in those markets right they were just really quarantined in there but you know when you think about it is the state really literally holding a gun on the heads of women which which it has been doing capital has been doing this this has been it's 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 bold but now we see it in practical terms that you know you know, market women could continue to sell and we could continue to get our food. So we have to think of, you know, this, the informal uh, economy itself, which in many countries across the continent constitutes, you know, 50 to, in Uganda, it has been even estimated at 85 to 90% of the economy, right? Uh, and of, of the working population. And many of these are women. Right, and you know there is going to be uh, forms of legal discrimination because a lot of these people are also not being even the way the government here responded. Um, a lot of people are not going to be recorded as employed. You know, so if you are going to be coming out with policies about uh, some kind of recovery to people who have been contributing formally to the the economy, we are going to leave out um, a lot of what is actually sustaining our economies and what has sustained them in this period of, of crisis. Uh, you can't record gender bias if you're not looking for it, in, in a sense. And the last thing I'd like to say about this then is tied to the question, and I think for me, this is the most important question. You know, we talk about social reproduction and social reproduction happens all the time, whether people are employed or they are not employed. So it is not something again that is being produced by crisis, it's being intensified as a, in, in this period. So it, it, it takes place whether or not people are, people are employed. And of course, also the structures and the resources that support social reproduction differ across continents and countries. So in the West, we'd be talking about, you, you know, a, a sort of securing some, you know, safety net, uh, you know, in universal uh, basic income, which has been a conversation in South Africa, not so much in other parts of the continent and so on. But for much of the agrarianized continent, um, the land remains central. So whether you're thinking of petty commodity production or subsistence production, even some forms of wage labor now really depend on land, access to the commons, and access to private land. So if you're going to deal with this thing structurally, we have to deal with those kinds of resources, structural resources that support, uh, uh, you know, social reproduction and care labor, um, whether the state exists or not. Because as I said earlier, there's just, there's such a huge section of the labor force that just doesn't matter to capital anymore. And it won't be accounted for, even in the post, uh, you know, like Crystal was saying, there's a lot that is going to be left out. There's a lot of people that are not going to be seen because you're simply not looking for them. So, um, so, so land remains relevant. You know, this is why I was saying for me, it has asserted, a, a, there's been a fundamentally agrarian character to this crisis. 
And so we need to be thinking of access, we need to be thinking of laws and economic policies that support this kind of access. Uh, many feminists have mentioned the idea of you know, food self-sufficiency. How do we create self-sufficient communities? And part of this really is we have to think seriously of delinking basic livelihood from wage labor, right, as we go ahead. And what does that look like? Thank you so much. Um, please, if you've got a question for the speakers, can you drop them in the chat box and I will read them out to the speakers. While we wait for questions, um, Crystal, you work with government, you work with um, human and um, women rights organizations. And do you think if we have women at the center of, you know, decision making in Africa, the response to COVID would be much better than what it is right now? Uh, thank you. Wow, what a question. Um, so <laughs> evidence has shown in countries where women are taking the lead, like New Zealand, this one definitely is better. Um, I also think um, it's about systems and structures. And so neoliberalism, patriarchy are systems and not really individuals. And so there's two points to this. Um, one, definitely representation is greatly lacking on the continent. Um, and that, I mean, it's unacceptable. Kenya, where I live, still hasn't accomplished its two thirds majority, which is by constitution with our government. And, and that's a fight that we, it's still incredibly amazing that we're still fighting. So that's the first. Um, second is leadership has to be feminist and not just women. Um, and, and there's a difference there. Um, but definitely, I think from what we are seeing, um, responses are different. Um, and framing and, and the political project backing that is different. And you can tell um, there is feminist framing in, in the success stories of policy interventions that have been successful in response to um, the crisis. I also think the politics of narrative and language are important. And as uh, Lynn um, spoke about informal, I question who determines what informal is and how can it be informal if close to 80% of your economy, close to 80% of your labor is in this informal and what we consider informal and how we address it. And if you, you can't address it if you're not looking for it, like Lynn says, so a lot of African countries, Kenya included, have given tax relief. Um, but I question who this tax relief for is the majority of the people that are taking the burden of the brunt of an economic slowdown are in the informal and outside of tax brackets. Um, suddenly, we're all talking about the care economy. Again, the politics of language, this term of care economy is really unpaid labor. Um, care sometimes, gives this idea of warm and fuzziness, where a lot of the time it's backbreaking work. It's nurses taking care of patients. It's women uh, going to fetch water and carry loads of, of, of firewood on their back, literally breaking their back. And so I question the politics of these narratives and language that are so unfit for the realities of, of what happens in terms of social production. But I think the silver lining to this is this crisis has turned all of that upside down. And suddenly essential workers are not bankers and tax planners and all of those who create value out of literally the air. Essential workers are frontline workers. It's the nurses, it's women who are taking care of sick people. It's women who have and always have been the backbone of our economy, the first of our society. Then suddenly the world is coming to the realization that that's where importance is. I wonder if that will mean, you know, how, how do we make sure that that momentum turns into policy change, policy change that is responsive and transformative for this body of work. Um, but at the same time, it also speaks to the power of community and organizing of which women, at least on the continent, have been doing so wonderfully and, and in spite and despite of government and capital and private sector. Um, of holding our economies and our societies up and keeping people fed and healthy. Um, and I wonder how the power of community organizing meets state policy making and what that means. 
Yeah. Sonia um, is back, so there are a lot of questions. Um, thanks. For, sorry about that um, internet issue. Um, there are quite a few questions in the chat box. Chat box. Um, there's one from Michelle that I'll address to you, Lynn. And the question is, has COVID given us an opportunity to find more fertile ground for ideas that might have been seen as too radical before the crisis? Yeah, uh, and I, I think that's part of that is what I was um, speaking to earlier. Is, uh, and, and, and Crystal has said this also. I think for the first uh, time, the, it's not just women, but the, you know, the idea of, of, um, of gendered labor, which is unpaid labor. And it's not a conversation that is abstract anymore. And it's not a conversation that we have to have in relation to the sort of uh, exploitation and surplus value uh, production that you know has made it so problematic and has you know feminist economists have received a lot of pushback you know from the mainstream because demonstrating the contribution of this uh, labor to uh, you know to, to to value to surplus value has been unmanageable right but you know, in, in many, many realms, just today I was reading, I think in Kenya, that they've resorted now to home-based care. I don't know what this will look like and, and how it is, you know, you know, partly because the health system is, is not coping and cannot cope, right? Not even just in the present, but with what is coming in the future. So here is the government just plainly saying we are going to uh, this is this is the route we are, we are going to take. Of course, without mentioning any of the actual labor and resources that are going to be needed to to, act, to implement that. And so that is an opportunity. The, the, you know, there are real opportunities for us to stay toe to toe with all these responses that are being uh, dished out, and to say. But we have, because we have the theories around this, we have the practice around this. African feminists have been talking about this for a really long time. So we have the evidence. And I think part of our task is to put the evidence in, in stark relief. Crystal and I have been part of a collective of African feminists who, who wrote out a, 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 an African feminist response, economic response. And part of the work we need to do, and we're thinking of doing around that, is, is to, to tell the policymakers and those in power, and I absolutely agree with, with Crystal, that we have to deal with the question of power. This, the, the economic crisis is really, you know, the, the response has to be a political response. So, all, all across the world, we are seeing different forms of resistance and they are manifesting in their intersections, not just with gender, but with race and with class. And there is a real opportunity. There is a real, you know, if you scroll through social media, people sharing resources that had been forgotten after the, at the uh, you, know, not, you know, at the end of the Cold War, at the collapse of the uh, Berlin Wall, there was some literature, you know, uh, you know, radical political economy, Marxist literature that people are having. But that that tells us something, right? So these are conversations. I think there's a real opportunity, and we have to to kind of uh, remain vigilant because there's a lot that will be done when we are not paying attention. So. Response. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, and and similarly for Crystal, I wonder how you how you whether you think that the pandemic is is an entry point for alternatives to emerge. Yeah, definitely. I'll take on. Lynn said it all. Um, 
<laughs> most of the time I sit here like you know the crisis is is horrible and the loss of life um the economic downturn everything but at the same time it sort of it keeps forcing us to rethink it's a moment where with all our everything this little virus has brought us to our knees us our economies our way of doing things and i've said this over and over again so apologies if this is said again but we can't go back to normal because normal was the problem um, but we're at a point of we're at a point in the fork of the road where we need to decide uh, collectively which way we're going to go and i don't think we can think about the corona crisis in absence of what's happening with black lives matter and this global push against an imperialism and the solidarity that's happening just yesterday i was told about um, a rural uh, town in kenya that has an ethnic name that translates to breathing and they've now nicknamed this place george floyd and i think that that says something around how we can see our oppression across global, across borders, across oceans. We are the same. We have the same oppressors. All oppression is linked. And I think, as as Lynn said, issues around power need to be centered. Um, power around race, around class, around geographic location. Um, take into consideration our histories, we can't let go of that. And our histories that have informed where we are today um, has to be at the center of our thinking. So I sit here sometimes sort of amazed that the world is coming around to concepts that just what, eight months ago seemed completely radical, completely outlandish by you know a group of you know crazy activists who nobody, you know, really have the time to listen to but suddenly we're talking about government policies around home-based care and yes we need to question like Lynn says what that means but for sure 10 months ago i would never have thought my government would be talking about home-based care and it's time for us because we've been developing this these ideas for so many years tirelessly women before us have been talking and setting you know creating these ideas that have always seemed crazy and outlandish and those ideas are all around us we all only need to pick them up now and they're slowly by slowly they're getting picked up but i think there's still such a fight in making sure that they're not just picked up but picked up in the way that we were meant because so many a time the ifis um you know multinationals will pick up all of our language and the women's movement knows this and suddenly the imf is talking about care work and the words they're saying are the same the meaning behind it is completely different so we have such a battle to still you know make sure that the meaning is kept true to what we were fighting for and how we defined it um and that we're also sitting at these tables of power and making sure that we are informing what this new normal will begin to look like so definitely the silver linings um yeah Thanks, Crystal, and thanks, Lynn. Um, and on that note, I will close the meeting and hand it back to Taibat. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful conversation. Um, we're really sorry about the network break, but you can agree with me that it, it was still a very insightful one, especially with the new um, issues that I probably didn't know about. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Sonia. Please, um, you can stay up to date with upcoming event. The next webinar is on Wednesday, 24th June, and the theme is on how to build a new society after the COVID-19 crisis with Arjun Chang. We hope that you will be able to join us on, on Wednesday, same time, 3 p.m., same platform. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Tiger. Bye, Crystal. Bye. 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 Thank you. Uh, I